all the programming and stuff. Terry is our district testing coordinator for Clear Creek. She's in the back of the room, so she does represent. Um, but you have the great misfortune of listening to me. <laughs> Uh, I'm a data analyst at Clear Creek ISD and the Department of Assessment and Evaluation. Um, and basically this morning I just want to take you through, uh, through three, three, three things. You know, I hope to connect with your head, your heart, and then um, offer a call to action. So for the head part, we're going to apply NRM assessment data to student goal setting, uh, which is a big initiative in our district. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about growth mindset. It's really important to me um, and to the work that I do to, to try to encourage uh, my own growth mindset tendencies and hopefully that will trickle down to you and you'll also develop some rhetoric that you can share with people back in your district. Uh, and then finally, connect to our feet or action. Um, if you were here early enough to scan the QR code, you already have two and a half. Uh, data protocols that you can take back and start implement, implementing those um, you know, as, as, as soon as you're ready. And they don't have to be used, they're not interim specific. They're generic enough data protocols that uh, they can be used in, in a wide array of circumstances. Um, but I'm going to walk through how they can be used after opportunity one or opportunity two, or at least for reading the map. All right, but we've been conferencing for three days, so let's do a quick check-in. Um, just kind of ask yourself, you know, uh, here I am, been in the Texas Assessment Conference. Some of us are entirely enthused and ready to, to tackle all of the challenges that await when we return to our home, home districts. Uh, some of us are completely overwhelmed and probably most of us are somewhere in between. So, if you were holding a compass, what would your bearing be? There's no right answer, no right, wrong answer, no good answer, no bad answer. There's only an honest answer. So someone can say, my bearing is true north because after this conference, I know exactly what I'm going to do for the rest of the year and I'm, I'm just going to blaze on through. And the other person can say, well, my bearing is also true north because this winter is going to be awfully stormy and cold and I'm not prepared, right? So there's only your answer. So just take a moment, take a few seconds, think about what's your bearing, why, and then share that with someone around the table. online testing was coming 
And so this would give our students exposure to an online testing platform. Right. Those, those, the first year, 1920, those, that's what we had in mind. Um, will it work? What's this all about? And will at least they get to test online? Um, so our, we have just a few campuses do it that year. Um, most of them we're just going to do it one time a year, not do the opportunity one, opportunity two. Um, but we really didn't even get into the data that much because we all know what happened in spring 2020. So, um, so just kind of sat there, except for one campus. One of our campuses really took to it. Uh, they love that looking at opportunity one, opportunity two, and seeing how their students grew from the fall to the spring. And they were able to celebrate that. Um, they were one of our targeted campuses, so it was really important for them to get some sort of success measure, right? Interim provided that opportunity. Move to the next year, um, really jumping off of the experience of that one campus who said, let's go, let's do let everybody. It's not costing us anything except time, and I know that's very, very valuable um, in campus life. Um, but uh, but we, we put all our eggs in the online testing basket for 2021. 20, uh, so we didn't do any paper assignments except for the handful of students uh, who, who still required it. But it exposed our students to that online testing platform again. So it was very important to us. Um, and quite honestly, as a department, and this is um, not saying anything about our new executive director because she is new. Um, she wasn't in our department until the summer. Uh, we dropped the ball on the data piece, right, for 2021. We didn't really push it on. My idea was, ah, here's some things you can do. You're going to do it. And, and well, they do. Um, so fast forward to this year with Ambium and the new platform, again, online exposure, but we are developing a much more robust data protocol to help our campuses actually apply what, um, what, what they get from the interim assessment. All right. The other part, um, so we have the interim. The other part that is a really big push with, uh, with our new superintendent and with me personally is this understanding of a growth mindset, right? So some quick definitions. Growth mindset is a belief, um, and it's a belief that with effort, perseverance, and practice, our talents, intelligence, and abilities can be developed. They can grow. Uh, the opposite of that, the fixed mindset, is that we are born with a certain amount of intelligence, talent, or ability, and practice might be able to get us from zero to what we're born to, but we can never rise above that. Um, growth mindset is not static. You don't either have it or don't. Um, you don't develop a growth mindset and then forget about it and you're always in a growth mindset. The example that I have for that is I can stand before you today to give this presentation, even though I'm terrified, um, because I know I'm going to learn from it, right? I'm going to get feedback from all of you. I'm going to be better at it the next time I give this presentation. It's going to be great. And then as soon as the session's over, I've really been thinking about rescheduling the meeting with the one campus. It's just going to give me a hard time throughout, you know. That's the growth fixed mindset, just going back and forth in a matter of an hour. This isn't, this isn't a one and done type of thing. So I have three strategies that I use myself on when I notice my tendencies uh, shifting toward the fixed mindset, how to get myself back on track with the growth mindset. The first one is this power of yet. Um, yet creates the expectation that something will happen, not just that something can happen, right? So uh, if I haven't done that yet, that means I'm gonna do it. <laughs> you know, when, when my partner asks me, have you taken the trash out? <laughs> No, not yet, <laughs> but I'm going to. Um, no, it will happen, okay? Um, and and that, that moves me forward. 
because it gets me out of my rut and, and, it, and it motivates me, at least personally, it motivates me to start taking the steps to accomplish the task or to develop that talent or whatever the case may be. The other thing that I like to use is uh, an iterative uh, process or iteration. And then I just wanted a rhyme there, so I put iteration, not expiration. Um, so to iterate is to repeat, right? That's all it is. Hopefully we're learning along the way. It's not implicit in that word necessarily, but that's, that's the idea is that we try something that doesn't work. We figure out what didn't work about it, and we try it again. We make little changes along the way. To expire is to quit. That's all that means. So we want to keep repeating the process. We don't want to quit. Mistakes are not final. Right? Mistakes are an opportunity to learn and try again. And then the last thing that I like to do, um, and, and it often, I think, gets lost, at least in, in the literature that I read about. They love this word yet. They love the iterative process. Um, not as many focus on, on this last one, but we don't always make mistakes. Sometimes what we do works. Sometimes what we do the first time works. So I think it's important to celebrate those successes, right? But not just say, yes, I succeeded, I deserved it, um, it, was, it was inevitable, not that type of thing, but to reflect on it. So we celebrate, yes, but then we reflect. Okay, what about that process was most effective? And how can I replicate that? And then, where did I hit those little bumps, and how can I smooth those out? Right? So we want, we want to always be reflective on our practices. So just a little practice on fixed mindset. These are some statements that we might hear um, on a campus in the district. Um, these I got from a resource. The final slide in this presentation has my bibliography on my source side. This is from a book called The Growth Mindset Coach. Uh, and you're familiar with that. So it's just it's just three statements of a fixed mindset, and then we're going to try to identify a growth mindset. So this first one, this student is incapable of making gains in math. All right, think, talk around your table. How could you convert that statement to a growth mindset? <laughs> right. This isn't the only way. I heard some, some good responses up there. I heard someone using the word yet. I love that. This is the way the book rephrased it, though. All right. So how can I present the information so the student will understand? It's moving away from a fixed mindset that the student has uh, born with a certain ability for math, and that student can't go above that. It's just impossible, right? And it's taking the focus on that student just needs a connection. The student needs to persevere, and the gains will come. This next one is on the other end of that spectrum. Same spectrum, just the other end. Uh, that student is a brilliant reader, and she doesn't need my attention. How can we talk on your table? How can we adjust that thought to a growth mindset? Tons of research would say is not true. 
And then this final one, um, now instead of the fixed mindset being on our students, this fixed mindset is kind of on ourselves, right? So my students ruin this lesson and they just refuse to cooperate. So one more time, please, around your table. And then... <laughs> district is this idea of goal setting. We, everyone in our district goal sets. We all know that superintendents have targets that the, that the board judges them by. Uh, we all know that we have our own um, um, growth plan, not growth plan, sorry, but, uh, <laughs> but yearly um, annual goals that, uh, that we develop and that we're uh, judged on. Our teachers have the T-test that they're writing goals, all that kind of stuff. So we know professionally we do the goal setting piece. In our district, we really focus on having our students also engage in this process in every classroom at every level, from pre-K on up. Uh, they work on, on goal setting. So when I was looking at goal setting, I found 12 steps for goal setting. Another one, I was like, that's too many. I found another one, seven steps for goal setting. It's still too many. Then nine steps for goal setting. I'm going the wrong direction. I like to keep it simple. Here's just four steps for goal setting. Plan, uh, identify, plan, execute, and review. All right, so when we identify, we're looking for actionable, measurable, observable goals. And we want those goals to be positive in nature, rather than negative in nature. And by positive, I don't mean that they have to be happy and and exciting and save the world from certain annihilation. No. It just, it, we want to identify behaviors that we can do instead of things that we want to stop doing. Um, so, so have positive goals. The goal that I'm going to use as my example this morning is I want to read more. Okay, that's a broad goal. So I've, I've identified a broad goal. Now I need to make it actionable, measurable, and observable. And so maybe I say, I want to read a particular book, something like The Hate You Give, and I want to do that by Thanksgiving. Okay? So now it's actionable. I'm going to read The Hate You Give. Uh, it's measurable because I'm watching my progress through the book. And my deadline is Thanksgiving, uh, and it's, it's observable. Right? Um, people can, can see me read it, and I'm doing something. My goal isn't to stop watching so much TV, my goal is to read a book. Um, after our, we've identified our goal, we want to set a plan, and we want to focus on the short term. Right? If my ultimate desire is to read more, I don't want to say I want to read 12 books in the next year. That's going to create anxiety. Um, when, when I get behind, when I'm on month three and still on book one, I'm, I'm going to say I can't do this. It's going to bring me back to that fixed mindset. So I want to focus on short term, and I want to create a plan. So to finish my goal of reading The Hate You Give by Thanksgiving, I'm going to read 30 minutes every school night right before I go to bed. Okay? Or before I go to sleep. So I'm in my bed, my bedside lamp on, I read 30 minutes, bookmark, Go to sleep. Um, and then I execute. Then I put it into action and I do it. And while I'm doing it, I'm recording data along the way. So, in my example, um, maybe I have a calendar. And so I give myself a, a nice sticker. Um, I like my little phone. Maybe I shouldn't say that out loud. So I put myself a little Rainbow Dash sticker on the calendar every time I. Uh, every time I read for 30 minutes, right? 
Um, so so I'm, I'm putting it in action, I'm recording the observations, and then when I get to the end, and then it might be Thanksgiving when I set my timeline, or it might be when I finish the book, if it's sooner than Thanksgiving. Right? But when I reach a point where it's time to review, I look at it. I look at my calendar. Maybe I see on my calendar that I didn't read five nights a week. Um, I only read two nights a week. And I didn't read for 30 minutes, I read for two hours. Because I really got into it. But I couldn't do that every night. So when I start reading my next book, maybe that's my new plan. I'm not trying to read 30 minutes every night. I'm trying to read two hours, two or three nights a week. Right? So I'm keeping what works, and I'm changing what doesn't. And then it's back to identify, if I want to adjust, plan, execute. How does that work? How does that work with all of this interim stuff? Right? Now let's start putting the pieces together. The interim, opportunity one in particular, Assuming I give it in the fall, um, there's going to be some, some things on that test that my student hasn't learned yet, hasn't been taught yet. But that data can provide a baseline and help identify the areas the student can grow. Right? So that's the idea for me behind Opportunity to Learn. It's not the score. It's definitely not that predictor of success on a star. It's what do I already know? What do I not know? And what can I identify, uh, or can I identify the places that I want to grow? Then we move into plan. These goals are set at the student at the unit level, right? I'm not. I'm not saying that I have a scale score of 3246, and by star I'm on a scale score of 3655. <coughs> That's not what we're focused on at all. We're looking at the unit level goals. You know, I was, I, I was, um, if I took the, the algebra one interim, you know, and, and I was really good at solving my equations, but graphs, they trip me up. So that's where I'm setting my goals. I want to get better at the graph, at the visual. Then we're executing. We have our goal, we're executing. And we recognize in clear degree that the interim is one data point among many. We have all of our formative assessments that we're doing you know, daily, or at least weekly. We have our summative assessments. We have you know, our, our little mid-unit quizzes or our common assessments, our unit tests, those type of things. Interim is just one of those data points. It's not the end-all, be-all. Uh, but it can play a role. And then we review. It does provide a great opportunity to review. If we give opportunity one later in the year, November, December, something like that, then we will have taught a lot of things. So for those uh, student expectations, SEs, TEKS, I, most of the time I use SE. Um, for the SEs that we already taught, we, we can review how we did it. And you, opportunity two, we will have gotten through even more of the curriculum, and so it provides another opportunity for you. And we'll walk through some protocols for that. The educator goal setting looks very similar to the student. We're using opportunity one to provide focus for future units. We're looking at that class aggregate or student aggregate, and we're figuring out um, where are the greatest needs, where are the biggest gaps, and how am I going to design my lessons to meet those needs? We're planning just at the unit level, so I'm not looking at the whole interim assessment as soon as I get it back. I'm thinking, what am I planning for now? Those are the items that I'm going to focus on. And then when we get to the next unit, the unit after that, I'll go back to the interim, find a few more items, and move forward. Execute, still going to give all those formative assessments. I'm still going to have my summative assessments, and the interim is just going to be one data point on a minute. And then I'm going to use those as reviews. Um, so I am going to see, is my teaching effective? Is it effective at getting the students to understand the concept, and is it effective 
at having the students retain that knowledge uh, for, for a period of time. We've given our interim one, uh, opportunity one. We have the data. How do we use it? So this is a screenshot from the new Cambium platform. Uh, I don't know if, if, how many of you have logged into it yet. But this is the CRS, Centralized Reporting System, whatever new acronym they're going to give us this year. We'll to change it almost next year. Um, so uh, this is the English 2. Yeah, English 2 test. Uh, you can see it right here. Um, the first thing that I recommend doing is toggling the standards keys button right there. That way it will identify the teeps um, or the student expectations there. I don't know why it doesn't do that automatically, <laughs> but it doesn't. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm an English teacher. I have this data now. Uh, so far, only one of our campuses has, uh, at least when I, when I pulled this screenshot, only one of our campuses gave the interim. So that's why, for the my students, it's, it's a smaller campus. The my students, the campus, the district, they, they're all the same because only one campus did it. Excuse me. Um, and the ESC, the Education Service Center, uh, we call our uh, Superintendent office building, whatever the main thing, the ESC that, and when I saw that, I was taken aback for a little bit. I had to think about it, reflect a moment. Education Service Center here, so we can see what our region is doing <coughs> compared to, to the rest of us, if, if you're into that. Um, but I'm an English teacher, and I'm not, so don't criticize my lesson planning too harshly. But maybe I want to do 2.4F. The inferencing deal, so I see that you know, there are a lot of questions that pertain to that. And, um, and I'm going to identify the, the item where they perform the highest and where they perform the lows. Right? So in question, oops, sorry. In question 17, In question 17, 76% of my students answered correctly, so that's the highest. And in question 14, 16% uh, answered correctly, so that's my lowest. Okay. Um, so if I go to the protocol, which you can access from the QR code if you haven't yet, this is the item analysis, analysis protocol. And there's the, the first two pages are the, kind of the step-by-step -step process, and then the second two pages or the graphic organizer it's intended to be written on this. My graphic organizer, I'm going to put my top items and my bottom items. There's space for four. Don't get lost in that. That's, that's just space availability on the page, right? Focus on how much time you have, knowing that the more you do this protocol, the quicker you'll get, and you might be able to do more than one item or more than two items eventually. But I would recommend starting with at least one top and one bottom, All right? So I'm just putting the number here. I'm putting the SE here. Again, student expectations, just the TEEP. Unless you have broken down your TEEPs in, into, into sub expectations, then be as specific as you want. Um, but at least the TEEP here. All right, and uh, let's see. And then we go into the actual item. So the blue hyperlink item numbers up here, we click on one of those, it brings us to the item, we read the question, we read any supplemental information that's available, um, and we fill in the graphic organizer. What skills or knowledge are necessary for the student to be successful in this? What do they need to know? Right? We can go back, read the answer choices, fill in this last comment, what are the common obstacles or, or misunderstandings or mistakes that students are going to make that are going to lead them to an incorrect response? So I want to identify what those are. It's basic item analysis stuff, right? Nothing new here, but we put that in our graphic organizers. And, uh, and after we get through all our questions, we reflect on it. So the first question, how can we leverage our strengths? So this top performing assessment, what do they need to know to be successful? How do we leverage that? How do we 
use that as a bridge to whatever else we need to teach for that unit. Um, how can we help them develop grit, right? We might purposely uh, put a few of these items in throughout our assessments so that they have a tough one, but then by question three, ah, oh, I know this, I'll keep going. And so it's encouraging, it's motivating them to, to, to keep on and not just give up where, so we're developing grit. Uh, and can we extend their strengths to new skills and, and content? All right. And then we do the same thing for the misunderstanding point, right? How can we improve the mastery over the lower performing expectations and overcome those common mistakes, those distractors? Uh, and then at the end of all of my protocols is this question, just what do you plan to focus on instructionally? Just kind of wraps it up. It gives the teacher an opportunity to summarize their focus. And so opportunity one, they don't know everything, it's fine. We're gonna do an item assessment on those that they did do well on or that they didn't do well on in order to plan for our upcoming units. Pros and cons. This is just a blank slide. I don't have anything filled in here because here's where I'd love your input. Just from that brief introduction, what do you like about it? What isn't gonna work? Right? If anyone has, has comments, I am open. Where do you get to critique the speed? Yes. I just like, like that it's a protocol to structure conversation, and I think sometimes teachers look at data and they pick one point and they're stuck on it, uh -huh. and it forces them to look at all of the data in a very structured way. You can also force them to look at the strengths, because I know um, you will automatically go to what they miss. Yeah. And not really capitalize on the strengths and know how to go from those. Okay. Thank you. Um, so one of the things we do with formal assessments is they need a success criteria. So how do the kids know that they know the material? That's the only thing that I would say with you know the, when you're looking at the item analysis with the kids, make the kids know that they I got I know I don't need to go with any more into it. Yeah. But I love everything else. I think it's fantastic. So appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, because I think you have just an easy way to see one number from opportunity one, a second number from opportunity two, and hopefully that number improved, right? And I'm going to celebrate. It went up one point, I'm going to celebrate because that student knows a little bit more than they did three or four months ago, right? If it's up even more, great. We'll, sit, we'll not celebrate more, but we'll celebrate that also. And so we are celebrating growth. What about those students who don't improve? That's where I have to practice my growth mindset. Encouragement, right? Like this is not, this is one, this is where we go back. This is one test. This is not indicative of your entire ability. You know, this is a stumble. Hey, 
what didn't work? <laughs> what, what were you doing these three or four months that didn't work? Not, it's, not, it's not blaming, right? It's getting them to reflect on, uh, on, on, on their own actions. We're doing the same thing as the teacher. We're reflecting on our actions, and we're asking the students to reflect on their actions. So that's the first thing I'm doing, is celebrating growth. Uh, the second thing I'm doing is learning from the rest. Um, so we happen to use Edgephoria. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak to the other assessment systems. Hopefully you have something similar because this is, this is a report from Lee Ford. It just happens to be in Edgephoria. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, other programs have access to the same thing. But it's the leadership report card, teacher learning reports, and if you use Edgephoria, AWARE, um, reports um, down at the bottom of, of, of the data section. This allows us to compare quickly, at a glance, three checkpoints. Okay, and th this is somewhat customizable in, in the single report. So in the first checkpoint, I'm putting all of my formative assessments that I have digitally stored. In our district, most of our formative assessments we call learning checkpoints, so that's why you see that there. And check two, I'm putting uh, all of my summative assessments. So we call them campus commons, um, the unit task, whatever. So that, that's checkpoint two. And then checkpoint three is where I'm using a cumulative assessment, something like, uh, like Emma. Okay? And this, is, this really is the least important in, in this report. Uh, because I'm only using this at the beginning of my protocol and I'm not really coming back to it. So if I have to use a second system to get this information, then that's a sacrifice, quite honestly, I'm willing to make. Because sometimes um, those types of, uh, of tests, whether we use interim or on map or whatever, it, it may not populate you know, in this lead forward report. So anyway, I'm comparing my formatives to my summatives to my cumulative tests is the idea. All right, and here's my graphic organizer. It's, it's a protocol that, that uh, I modified from one that I created um, previously that I call Save to the Classroom. It goes along with my data yoga thing and all that kind of stuff, long story. Anyway, um, from the cumulative assessment, I'm identifying the top performing SEs and the bottom performing SEs. Okay. So uh, overall, on the cumulative, where were they strongest, where were they weakest? And then I'm going into that summative formative thing from, from the Leap Forward report. And I want to identify primarily, were they strong in the formative but weak in the summative? Or vice versa, weak in the formative, strong in the summative. Now I know it could be strong, strong. It could be weak, weak. I'm focusing on these two. Why? In my mind, if they were strong on the formative, attack, the formative assessments, they learned the material. They learned it. They were able to do it. But somewhere along the way, they forgot it. And so they didn't perform as well on the summative. Vice versa, for this one, if they were weak on the formative, they may have struggled. They didn't learn it right away, but they persevered, growth mindset, and they retained that information um, through the summative assessments. Right? So those are the things that I'm interested in. And I want to know the learning activities. I want to know the classroom experiences. What was happening for the students uh, when we had these results? Because ideally, I want to keep, well, I, I want a combination of these two. You know, in the, in the top performing SEs, I want to know those learning activities that, uh, where my students were able to grasp the content and retain the content. And the learning activities down here, in the bottom performing SEs, uh, those are the ones that I probably want to avoid. Because they weren't effective. They just weren't effective. And, and this isn't an absolute, this is an ongoing review process because our students change, the content changes, one learning activity may be good for this content but not that content. That's professional judgment that all of us have to make. This is just an idea 
I mean, this is just a protocol and, a, and an organizer to get us thinking about those things, right? Um, and then, of course, we reflect. So we start to learning activities, see more, be more successful um, at the, at the long-term performance. And beyond these teaching and learning activities, how does the rigor of our form of assessments compare with the rigor of some of the more cumulative assessment? I think, I think that often gets lost, too. Um, at least just in the, in the basic structure of this table. Because uh, formative assessments, you know, they're out the door, exit ticket, <laughs> they're, they're moving fast, and so they're not reading a passage and answering the question, they're reading a few sentences and answering the question. And all of a sudden they get all these cumulative uh, assessments and they have five different passages to read. And, and, and you know, the rigor is, is inequitable. And so that's something that, that we need to factor in here. And then what are we going to focus on as a result? All right, so that's my stage in the classroom. What do you think about it? Let me have it. Anything you want? about your conversations with your PLC teachers, right? Your group of teachers and having that conversation of, well, this one did really well. You, your kids did really well in this question. Let's talk about instructional strategies. That's where the power of some of this comes from. Okay. To build on what she said, it used to be that the campus is it was very adversarial. Like, my campus did really great and we're not poor, but we did make our campus look better than everybody else's campus and the mindset needs to shift that it's really us versus the state as a district and we need to get together and build it strong with all of us and help us build up and not just keep that in the house we need yeah. to share that out so kind of what she said like you get to get people together and maybe even be at the district level you get people together and look at the data and say look campus came is really great on this particular one let's build on what did you do and help the whole yeah, I don't. I don't think there's anything. That, I did create these protocols, right? That's my my little logo that I had commissioned for me up there. I like it. Um, my yoga graph guy. Uh, none of this is copyrighted. Use it as you will. Um, there's nothing magic about it. There might be misspellings. Fix them and share them. You know, whatever. So yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to sell anything. All right, so throughout this, um, this presentation, I promised you three things at the beginning. I promised that I would uh, connect to your head by applying interim assessment data to facilitate goal setting. I said I would connect to your heart by trying to strengthen your growth mindset tendencies, as well as give you rhetoric to develop that in others, and um, then give you some protocols um, to analyze and understand interim assessment data after each opportunity. I said that there were two and a half protocols in, uh, in the folder, the digital folder. The last one is just a student quadrant analysis. Um, there's no step-by-step no -step walkthrough. That's why I'm only calling it a half a protocol. But basically, uh, it's looking at, it goes back to the student goal setting piece um, after any assessment, really. It doesn't have to be interim. It's just, uh, I, I might have my axes confused, but uh, did they get it right? Did they get it wrong? Did they know it? Did they get it? Right? And they just go through each item and they put a mark, they put the number of the item in each of those quadrants. So, uh, so I got it right and I knew it. Uh, I got it right, it was just a guess. Um, I got it wrong, but I really thought I, I got it right. Or I got it wrong and well, it was just a guess. Right. And I like to focus on this quadrant analysis for goal setting. I like to focus on the, um, I was, I got it right, but I guess, and I was sure I got it right, but I missed it. Those are the two that I like to focus on. And the questions that I ask 
for the, um, I was sure I got it right, but I missed it, is what led you astray? What mistake did you make? What was the distraction? All that, you know, typical, uh, typical thing. But on the, um, I got it right, but I guessed one, I tried to tap in, what led you to that answer? What was your hunch? What assumptions were you making? What little piece of knowledge were you, were you using to justify choosing that answer over all the other answers, right? Because we're going to build off of that. Um, we're going to correct these mistakes, and we're going to build off of this prior knowledge. So that, that's the half data protocol that you have in, in that poll. And none of this, none of this is, is about formal assessments at all. Um, this is about us as professionals always improving, always being better, caring about our students, wanting them to improve, wanting them to be better, and leading by example. Right? Now, I, I, wish, I wish I could turn off the predictor in the Cambium system for approaches, meets, and masters on that start. I don't use it at all. Um, I use the data from the assessment to help educators and students set goals and to celebrate the growth that, that they're making through the year. So thank you so much. Here's my email. Um, here's the, the site. Again, this, this should be in, uh, in the presentation in the digital folder. So uh, if there are any questions. We have about 10 minutes too, so I'll hang around. Uh, if anyone you know, wants to ask a question privately, thank you so much.